All right, let's just get right into it. Welcome back to the homestead. This is the, actually the rest of the day after you guys watched the hose video. We moved right into this video. So you guys can see we're working hard for you guys so we can keep you up to breast on what's going on around this homestead, okay? Because now we have a major problem with the bees, right? The other day I was working on this patio. If you guys saw that video, um, real quick, I wasn't trying to show you guys how to build a patio. You always want to make sure your patio is slightly slanted away from the building so the water drains off of it. I didn't get into all that stuff, but while I was making the video, I mentioned that you want to make sure you have a fresh air intake into your root cellar and a way to get the spent air out. And I thought that was a really important point, hence the video title, okay? So I'm working on this patio here. Uh, trying to get this ready for the learning center. And I was uh, having to bring in some dirt on the corner over there so the rock wouldn't fall out. And I keep a big pile of dirt out in the woods there, okay? Which is also where we keep a couple of our beehives. Now in the process of going back and forth to get the dirt, I try to keep an eye on the beehives. And I was looking over at the horizontal hive and I noticed there was almost no activity at the horizontal hive, which is totally strange this time of year, and especially with this heat. At a minimum, I should see some bearding where they're hanging out in front of the beehive and trying to, you know, keep cool and all that kind of business. And there was like nothing going on. So I was like, oh no. So I came and dumped the dirt off and I jumped um, into my suit because I didn't know what to expect. I got my hat on and my helmet and my stuff and my little equipment and I went over there and I checked out the beehive and what I found was not good okay so I came back I called Dr. Leo and we talked about it for a little bit and he said yeah I'm gonna come right up basically he dropped what he was doing and wanted to come up so we could get into this beehive see what happened and then we could explain it to you guys a lot of y'all are new beekeepers out there and you know it's not rainbows and unicorns you know sometimes you guys are going to run into jam ups and we're just trying to show you these jam ups and then show you how to work through them so you can be a better beekeeper a better homesteader you know just a better person all around so dr leo is getting ready to come on right now and we're going to go over here to the woods and see what's going on Deer laying down here through the night. I can tell. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, so now we're out here in the woods. This is our horizontal hive, and this is our friend Dr. Leo. In case you're new to our channel, uh, Dr. Leo and all, Dr. Leo and I have produced a lot of bee videos to help you guys out on your journey that have well over a million views on them now. So we really appreciate you guys tuning in to check out these videos. And uh, you want to say anything real quick? Yes. Hello again, <laughs> and there. Uh, I think it's a very important video today yeah. uh, because instead of the happy end there of pulling in hundreds of pounds of honey from the hives, we have something that's less expected, but it's a very important lesson in natural beekeeping and in life in general. Yeah. Um, I'm Dr. Leo, I'm a natural beekeeper in the Ozarks of Southern Missouri and uh, I have a website horizontalhive.com with free plans for building your horizontal hives and free advice on getting started keeping bees with a smile. Yeah, it's a great resource, so make sure you guys check that out. I'll leave a link down below, plus it just flashed right across the screen here. So we're gonna open this thing up and just see what we see. All right. Well, some six weeks ago when we visited this hive together, it was bustling with activity and lots of bees and yeah. there we were very much looking forward to the bountiful honey crop. But I can tell by the smell of it that uh, honey is not what we are going to discover now. Oh, you can, is there an odor? I'm bad with smells, so you can you smell a difference or something? Yeah, it's kind of a fermented smell mm. of... Because uh, the honey is so hot? And no, it's because there the critters that are now consuming your honey here fermented. Right. And it has this uh, smell of... Oh, there it is. This. Yeah, I can actually yeah. smell it now. There you go. All right. Wow. Okay, the hive is empty. So we cannot even say that the bees died because what most probably happen is they absconded yeah. once the nest started to be overrun with their wax moths and this is what we have now we have our small hive beetles and wax moth and these are scavengers that are after whatever's left out 
uh, of the colony when the bees are gone. So how do you think it might have happened? That's the puzzling part to me. I mean, the, the hive was totally strong. I know we moved the entrance over because they were looking really strong. And I kept an eye on them. They looked really good. And within like just a few days, this is where we're at now. Mm. All right, let's go through it and uh, maybe we'll have some more uh, cues as to what have happened. So, wax moths and small hive beetles. Um, here is a way to tell these are two creatures. The little larva that have pointed ends like this. This is the small hive beetle, a pastor native to Africa and they lay eggs are in the cells that have some protein in it that means pollen or brood or cocoons and when these tiny larvae hatch they start uh, devouring everything and destroying the comb the other one that we see here is wax moth and the wax moth so they the spin cocoons yeah these are the small butterflies the right. moths they infiltrate the hive and they're they lay eggs, and when the lays uh, the eggs hatch, the larvae start crawling around, and they spin these kind of uh, cocoons, and they're destroying the comb too. They feed on bee bread, on honey, on uh, bee brood, on uh, cocoons. All the cocoons are destroying the hive, and then they pupate and produce a new generation of wax moth and the cycle repeats itself until right. there is nothing left. So we have the double whammy of beekeeping. Uh, yeah, you know, or actually I lose more bees to small hive beetles than to varroa mites, that's for sure. But uh, as long as the colony is very strong, they can defend themselves. Right. They would be cleaning it all out right. and staying uh, clean. So what happens are uh, here is that for some reason the colony could no longer defend themselves from the pest and the, my guess is that because they were so strong and we were short on equipment and we were not able to take several splits of them they became overpopulated and their congestion is one of the triggers of swarming mm. and if they swarmed and you didn't see the swarm coming out what happens on that very day is half of the worker bees leave and the proportion of bees to the area of the honeycomb that they need to guard and protect suddenly drops by 50 percent mm. and the sudden drop in the workforce allows these pests to run around and deposit many eggs and the right. bees cannot keep up anymore with the cleanup and defending the comb which means that uh, you know one of the keys of preventing this from happening is to have the colonies at the peak of their strength but preventing them from naturally swarming um, because otherwise you won't have enough bees to take uh, care of this very larger uh, household all right now uh, all of that is not wasted because this is beeswax that you can melt and make candles and uh, beauty products from right. it may not look clean right right now but it's very easy to purify you cut it out you put it in a cheesecloth make a bundle and put it in boiling water all of the impurities will be left inside uh, inside the bag and the melted beeswax will come out of the bag and when it cools down it will solidify like a big thicker pancake on top of the uh, bucket with the boiling water right and uh, another comment I have is that I remember just why we were not able to expand this nest more in the springtime or in the summer. This was because these uh, frames were cross combed, meaning that the wax uh, combs were um, built connecting several frames together, like you can see on this one. Right and there, um, this was full of honey and we didn't want to rip it apart uh, because then the honey would start running and they're smothering many bees so we decided to wait until the harvest time to address this cross coming issue and uh, uh, moving forward we really will want to prevent this cross coming right. cross coming is natural of course but uh, 
uh, it makes hive management much more complicated and uh, we cannot do the things we would want to do to the colony to give them more space. So uh, I remember you had some of these frames that had... Yeah, we moved a couple to them in there. Yeah. So I wanted to give you some tips on preventing this cross calming uh, in the future. So if you want to give bees the freedom of building their own wax, which is uh, great, then do not use what they sell in the Kermers uh, by the name of foundationless frames. Foundation is the sheets of wax that you put in frames like that. Mm -hmm. Some of the frames are sold like that and they're called foundationless so that the bees can build their own comb. That's all right, but you need to give them a very good guide to get them started on the straight line. Right. And unfortunately, this triangular shape that they put uh, on these top bars is not sufficient to provide guidance of where the center of the comb is. Just the protrusion of it is uh, not tall enough to get bees started in the straight line. It will work on many of the frames, but on some others they will start connecting combs together. Right. So if you ever want to let the bees build their own comb, you either need to give them a strip of foundation, uh, that means the piece of wax imprinted with the beginnings of the cell, like right. this. Just give them a strip and they will start drawing it down. Or use a frame that instead of this triangular shape that doesn't reliably work, has a T shape like this. Yeah, you could see that's deeper there. Yeah, it's much deeper and then it's really abrupt. So when they start hanging in bunches, drawing new fresh comb, they do it from the lowest point and this provides a much more secure guide to get them started building in the straight line down. Right. You know, in other words about foundation, I see that you've used a, a plastic foundation. This is something I avoid yeah. uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, bees need to have the freedom of uh, making holes in the foundation under the comb for ventilation and for traffic. So even if they have a thick frame like that, if they have to put a hole here for ventilating or for excess from one bee way between the frames to the other during the winter, they will make pop holes all over. Of course, that's not something they're able to do uh, with the plastic foundation. This is, of course, convenient for you as a beekeeper right. to order and have the frames that arrive with this already pre-installed. Right. But uh, uh, I don't use plastic foundation just because it doesn't give the bees the freedom of arranging their nest uh, as well, they, they would like it. In, yeah. the way they need it. And if you guys are new, um, the reason why we had those is because we went from the vertical hives to the horizontal hives. And this actual design of the horizontal hive that you can get for free on his website um, is able to accept those frames. So it was good because I was able to reuse the equipment and now we have the other boxes it takes a little bit different frame so that's why we had those frames. I was new to beekeeping and that's what they sold. Remember we told the guys that um, your mentor teaches you things and then you learn those things and then you got to kind of keep digging so you can learn more and then change some things because that mentor taught me to use those plastic frames but that's really not the best way to do natural beekeeping. <laughs> yeah, correct, Doug. But unfortunately, foundation that they sell today in America right. can be even a, even worse even worse than yeah. using plastic because it's contaminated with uh, a lot of pesticides. Right. Actually, I brought you something to read if you have a moment. Like, you know, some people read horror stories. I brought you one of these horror stories. I don't need to read, you know, Stephen King -er at night <laughs> because for me, this is the horror stories. It's called the uh, pollution of wax in the beehives in North America with the agrochemicals. Right. And that's produced by the leading universities with all the analysis, etc. But you read into this article and all of a sudden there are pages and pages of tables listing all the uh, chemicals they find in beeswax. Right. Beeswax is like a sponge. It takes in whatever the bees bring into the hive from the surrounding fields. Right. And not only that, amazingly, the most prevalent chemicals found in these beeswax and American beehives is not the ones that the bees be, uh, bring from the fields surrounding the hives, but the chemicals that most beekeepers put in their beehives trying to control wax moths and their varroa mites and small hive right. and whatnot, especially the varroa mites. 
Uh, so what's the alternative? Well, foundation does uh, offer many advantages. You'll have straight comb, uh, the cells will be uniform. Uh, I always make sure that I have a few frames in my beehives or that are foundationless, meaning the bees build their own comb. Right. And the, the reason for that is you can tell on this one, the, and the cells are so much bigger yes. than the cells imprinted on the foundation. Yes. The bigger cells is where they rear drones, the male bees. And beekeepers traditionally have been uh, hating drones because these do not collect honey. They only go and chase queens from other hives. And bees, as you can tell by these brown cells, the brown is the color of the cocoons that were left behind. It means that here a lot of drones were reared at the expense of consuming honey in this color. Another frame of mostly drone brood. Another frame of drone brood. Right. And in nature, about 17% of all comb that the bees build is drone comb, which is great for them because they need it for procreation, right. but not so good for honey production because uh, the drones consume honey to fuel their mating flights, but they do not contribute uh, directly to honey production. Right. So for this reason, the keepers are using uh, frames with their foundation imprinted with smaller cells to produce small bees. But almost all foundation in America is uh, polluted with pastas. Right. For example, the famous bee breeder in Europe, Fert, uh, the author of uh, Raising Honey Bee Queens, is saying that if you raise drone bees uh, in uh, conventional f foundation frames, the uh, semen of these drones will not be viable anymore because they're being raised in a highly polluted environment. Makes and total it, sense, and just like know, humans. And yeah, just look at this picture, uh, at these tables, like, Page so upon page many. of front and back. Yeah, front and back list of agrochemicals that you find in almost all beeswax uh, produced in America. Wow. Uh, so my solution was uh, to use my own beeswax that I harvest in the wilderness and they're uh, melting it and making foundation, but it is a very slow and tedious process and you need a special mill right. to imprint this hexagonal part on the least right. of wax. So it's not really practical to do it for most beekeepers unless you have a very large operation and a large amount of wax. And by the way, I wanted to show you the contrast. This is the beeswax that I get from my bees by melting uh, the comb that they don't need anymore. And this is the commercial foundation that you buy through bee supplies. Right. Do you notice the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Then smell this. Yeah, my smell. And smell this. Not as good, but yeah. Well, I can smell it for you. Yeah. This smells like very um, saturated smell of hive bees beeswax. This one. Yeah. This is very aromatic. And this smells almost of nothing. Nothing. Well, the reason for this contrast is that there most of the foundation produced in America is made not from the brood comb like that. It's made from cappings, what they remove from the cells when they extract honey. And this is virgin white wax right. like that. Uh, the problem with that is that when the bees build their own honeycomb, they don't just use wax, they mix it with propolis. This is this brown stuff here. Yeah, that's like the sticky glue. Mm -hmm. And not only it makes the wax stronger, it also gives it strong virus and bacteria killing properties. So the generation of bees raised in the cells stay healthier because they're surrounded by all of this propolis. Right. So when you give bees a commercial foundation, not only it's the wax that has no uh, propolis in it, but also it's contaminated with all of these agrochemicals. So searching for a solution, I uh, tried foundation from all over the world, and the best one I found that's the closest to what I produce myself in my apiary comes uh, from the mountains of Spain, and this is what I use. Spanish beekeepers in the mountains are uh, keep bees away from a uh, agricultural right. fields. It's wilderness beekeeping, just as I do it in the Ozarks. So they produce foundation using the hull of the comb like it should be. It has this wonderful sweet smell. Uh, it has almost no traces of pesticide. 
you know, like it's impossible to find foundations totally, with zero yeah. because yeah. we are on planet Earth and all of these chemicals circulate in uh, the atmosphere. But compared to the conventional load of pesticides, this is something I'm comfortable using yeah. uh, in my beehives. Now, do they send an analysis on with it, or do they? If you ask them, they can give you something. Yeah, like they can. That? They can. If you compare, yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the analysis is very. Uh, expensive right. and every batch will have a slightly different, different. analysis yeah. <clears throat> but this compared with that is really a night and day and there's something you have on your website yeah i, I use it myself in my beehives mm -hmm. and also it's available on horizontalhive.com yeah. in a size that specifically fits the horizontal hive frames of the european lens right. format which would be like this right which is like the new style that we have in the mm -hmm. hive we're going to take you guys over to in a second so now that we're at this point of our um, discovery what's next so uh if you have a hive where that's that's dead but this hive is not really dead we don't see a single dead bee right that means that they just left and uh, I think that what probably happened first, there was swarming. Right. The, a swarm left and the remaining portion of the hive left behind was not strong enough. And they uh, started being overrun by uh, wax moth and small hive bills, and at which point they swarmed out too. It's called absconding. Right. So uh, they are somewhere in the environment. Right. I wish you had one of your swarm traps installed. Probably could have caught them, huh? Yeah, yeah. you might have caught your own swarm this way. But uh, uh, so one thing about the bees is they have this internal clock, and they know that they're running out of time. So they were trying to battle with the bugs, and they couldn't win. So they have to leave now because time is of the essence. If they don't get into a new home, start to develop uh, comb and brood, and get ready for winter, they're not even going to make it through the winter. No. So. Uh, and for them, you know, having a lot of possessions is a burden. Yeah. Isn't it like that for, for us, us too? too? <laughs> Uh, it's like having all of this property that requires upkeep and maintenance and yeah, U-Hauls and everything. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what to do with this is uh, inspect every comb. Right. And if it is not severely damaged like this one. That's not too bad. You can salvage it. If you were to leave it at room temperature like that, the destruction will continue. Sure. There are small eggs that we may not see now. So even if you shake out all of the larva, they may s still sure. be some left behind and as they hatch, they will continue destroying the comb, eat it all. Uh, spinning uh, the cocoons and like until nothing is left. Right. So if you want to save this, you need to freeze it for 48 hours. Right. Uh, freezing uh, kills the small hive beetles and wax moth in all stages, right. adults, larvae and eggs. Right. And just then put that in some sealed container and keep it until you can use it again in your beehive uh, because this will make an excellent ready-made comb for storing honey in the following year. Right. So we'll just go uh, through that and they're culling whatever comb is malformed or just uh, damaged too much. For example, I won't uh, try to salvage this because it already has a lot of these cocoons and damage to it and uh, it's not a complete comb anyway. So. To do this, just salvage the wax. Right. Wax is a wonderful uh, product you can use for making candles and beauty products. Sure. And again, it's very easy to render it into the purified yeah. wax. Yeah, we'll walk you guys through that whole system after he gets out of here. I'll go getting into getting into this stuff, uh, separating it, and then maybe I'll show you guys how that all works. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to walk over and check out the other hive. You want to do that while yes, we're here? Yes, absolutely. Or do you have more to do here? Or we no, pretty I just much wanted see what to show. Need. Yeah, I just wanted to show you that you take a knife. If you have plastic foundation that has um, wax built on it, you just scrape it off right. with a teaspoon. Right. Um, but. Uh, with uh, this wax, you just take a knife and you cut it off the wires. That's one thing that happens when they get in there is they make it all smushy like that. Yeah. So take this and put it in a bucket with a liner or cheesecloth or yep. old t-shirt with no printing. Then put it in bundle and in boiling water and what will come to the surface after everything cools will be this nice pure uh, 
yellow beeswax. And all the bugs and larvae and everything will just die in there, and so you'll be all set. So, And one thing uh, we were talking about, too, that we might want to mention to you guys is you don't want to just let this thing fester right here, okay? Because these hive beetles and these moths, they're laying eggs, and their their job is survival, so they want to drop back onto the ground so they can get this life process going all over again. So all you're going to do is if you let all this get onto the ground is you're going to contaminate the whole area that your beehive yeah, is in. Yeah, especially with the small hive beetles because yeah. the small hive beetles are they complete their life cycle in the ground. Right. The wax moths, these are butterflies that lay eggs and have these big fat worms uh, for larvae. They can complete their life cycle inside the box, but but the small hive beetle. <laughs> That's exactly that. why we had to replace that wire. And we did not. And we did not. Okay, and the small hive beetle. <laughs> This is live TV, folks. <laughs> they, they need to go into the ground and to pay there. So if you let these are uh, smaller uh, larvae go to the ground here, they will just produce another generation of uh, small hive beetles. Right. So don't leave it behind. Put it in the bucket. If you have chickens, give it to your chickens. Um, if you are rendering wax, it will take care of the problem, right. but Doug is totally right. Just don't let it uh, sit here for weeks or yeah. breeding pests. All right, so we're going to pick that lid up that just busted off of here, and then we're going to go check out this other uh, beehive. <laughs> uh. Now this is the hive that we split off of the other hive. So these are the wild bees that we actually caught in a swarm box that are local native black bees. And so we're grateful for that. We were able to continue that bloodline. And then the other two hive um, that we have, maybe we'll get to them today, maybe we won't. Um, those are the transported bees that I had brought in and you know, before I learned about natural beekeeping and stuff, so. So see, even though Doug lost one hive, he still has three hives after starting the season with two. Right. So that's the importance of breeding your own stock because you will have mortality. Right. Some of them will die during the winter. And again, you know, it's part of natural beekeeping because the natural colonies living in bee tree in the woods, they die too. Yeah. To Just the same path. Nobody gets out alive. <laughs> but if you keep uh, multiplying them faster than they swarm out to parish, your apiary will keep increasing in size. That's right. And I was mentioning uh, earlier as well, we had a lot of problems with the black ants. I lifted this lid off and inside the black ants were real heavy. They had eggs going on. So I got them out of here, scurried them out. And then I put some DE around the bottom and that keeps them from climbing up the legs and getting back in here. So mm -hmm. I guess we're going to see what we got, huh? Yeah. You know, for me, opening a, a layens horizontal hive uh, is always like a feeling of coming home because uh, it is just the most pleasurable form of a horizontal hive to work with. See, we open it and we're not seeing any bees right now. What kind of moth is that there? Uh, it could regular. be any kind of moth, but see, this may be wax moth, but the thing is that any beehive you will see will have wax moth and small hive beetles and varroa mites in there. Right. So all of them are in there waiting for the hive to become weak so they can multiply. Right. Uh, so see, we open the hive and you can put the palms of your hands on the top bars and they will sl feel slightly warmer in the spot where they're rearing brood right. here on these frames. Like this one is cooler and this one is, this is a very warm too. And there uh, these uh, lanes, European style frame, doesn't have gaps between them. The American frame and the other hive required the additional cover boards because there is this crack between the top bars. So here we are not disturbing any bees just by opening the hive. The spacing is different too. The old books on horizontal hive beekeeping will tell you that the ideal spacing for the horizontal hive layout is one and a half inch uh, uh, spacing between the ribs of the combs. The American is one and three eighths of an inch, so one eighth of an inch less. This is another reason why in frames like that the bees are encouraged to do cross combing. Right. They just don't get enough room that they need. Okay, so let's crack it open and take a peek inside. So we transferred this hive from the Langstroth, which is the American vertical hive standard, to the Layens. 
they produced a new queen. Here are the small hive bills. Mm -hmm. Please meet them. Their names are Paul, Ringo, John, and George. You can see how the bees are changing them. Yeah, you see the bee just jumped right on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a chance, just you can smash one or two with your hive tool just for for the pleasure of it. I actually have a special <laughs> tool that I carry in my toolbox. <laughs> it's called the Beetle Smasher. Yeah. I got it at one of the beekeeping conferences and I really like it. It even has this shape. If the beetle hides here in the corner, you can still reach them like that. Yep. And sometimes you have to go top, 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 top. Anyway, so... Wow, this color looks very nice. Uh, with all this capped honey and the brood underneath. This is the ideal arrangement for upcoming winter. And there are some people write to me saying, I open a hive and I see that there is brood and honey on the same frame. Am I doing something wrong? They're doing no. everything right. Exactly, that's <laughs> how they do it in nature. The whole point of having this multi-story hive was to separate brood from honey. Right. But it creates all kinds of problems for hands of beekeeping. Here, when I have honey and brood on the same frame, I know that the bees have the resources right there on this frame to feed themselves and to provide for their young. When you separate brood from honey, it's more convenient for managing a hive but then you need to be always watching to make sure right. that they have enough resources left after you pull honey. Beautiful. This is a heavy frame. And this is the pattern of our, um, brood and egg laying by the queen that made me fall in love with this particular style of horizontal hive called the Layens hive because the bees now have the ability on a frame like that to l produce brood in a completely circular pattern. The American frame that's just nine inches deep is not deep enough for them to do it in a sphere or in a round pattern and the closer it is to a sphere the easier it is for them to ventilate and protect and uh, to heat too. Is that on both sides? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Another big benefit of having a frame that's only 12 inches wide as opposed to the conventional American frame that's 17 and a half inches wide is that there is much less space on each side of the brood cluster again aiding the bees in warming it and protecting it and having this snug environment that they would have in a bee tree in the woods. Yeah, that fits really tight. It is a lot different than the other, either horizontal hive with the other frames and the vertical hives. This is very, very tight fitting. Okay, and we don't need to go over all of the frames, uh, but I wanted to show you the frame that was the Langstroth frame, the previous uh, video. So what we did, we had the, the Langstroth frame that we cut short and we screwed it into the lens hive to have it transferred into this new format. And you can tell that the bees have completely recovered from this surgery and they are um, rearing brood on this frame too. There are now the will they connect those two frames and fill in this here? Yeah, eventually they will if you give them enough time. Mm -hmm. But this is a frame that's completely simulated. There is capped brood, there are larvae in there, there is capped honey. And the next frame had the, the frame filled in by the bees all the way to the bottom. So the upper portion of this frame is what we gave them when we cut the Langstroth frame and embedded it here. And this is their new construction. And they did make it in two planes, but they didn't connect it to the next frame, so it's all good. 
and eventually when you spin this frame for honey in the following year you'll be able to cut off this uh, lower tongue. Beautiful. I like what I see and again even though you lost uh, you lost the mother colony the these genetics perpetuates itself in this new hive and the life goes on. So you think we'll need uh, a couple more frames for them? Because it looks like they're at the end almost. Uh, yeah, I agree. We can add uh, one or two frames. Uh, with the new colonies I try adding frames relatively slowly yeah so they don't have so much volume as happened in the other Too much work. they cannot right. then they cannot keep up with it okay I'll go get the frame just one or two or what uh, yeah I would I would do one just one yeah or, or a couple let uh, if you want to be sure you can check the foundation frames on this side too and see how far they progressed in uh, uh, building on these frames and if uh, if there is not much progress then uh, all alone. you need is a couple frames so there's nothing frame. on there yeah so this frame is still just starting to be transformed they're starting to draw out the frame yep. the cells yep like that drawing them out from the foundation the other one is pretty much constructed so yeah, I would say I would add one more frame on that end there, so they have... And then put the divider board and back. And then put the divider board back. Right. All right, well, we'll go grab that frame right now, and then we'll yes, close it up. Very good. And there is one more trick here. When you're sliding these uh, frames back, if you don't want to smash any bees, you can give a puff of smoke, and this causes them to go down. So when you're sliding the top bars back together, you are not crushing any bees. And see, this is the same genetics as in the previous hive that was really mean, um, but uh, they have uh, even better home here than they had in the other hive. Yeah. Not only the shape of the frames is more natural, but this one is insulated with natural wool inside, right. which gives them so much protection they feel uh, very much at home in this box. Snug. Yeah. Okay, we're done. That's it. Did you want to go out and check the two out in the field? Let's do it. All right, we're going to go check out two more hives, so stay with us now. Don't go anywhere. And Hit that subscribe button in case you haven't subscribed yet. He'll be back up for some more visits. And we have a big announcement at the end of this video that you're not going to want to miss. All right. I like this little tool here. <laughs> Now just a short walk from the forest are our other two beehives. This is a horizontal hive that we started off with. Again, we started with the vertical hives, then we went to the horizontal hive, and now we're comparing the horizontal hive with a Lane's horizontal hive. Lane's horizontal hive. The one with shorter and deeper frames. Yes, oh. more natural. Yeah. Yes, so we're gonna open these up now and we're gonna see what's going on with them. And again, if you wanna build these yourself, you're welcome to do it. Dr. Leo has the plans on his website, totally free, horizontalhive.com. Or if you're not a building kind of folk person, uh, Dr. Leo builds them and ships them out, right? Yeah, we can ship it anywhere in 48 states. Yeah. Or, and uh, that's a very good way of getting started. Uh, get a swamp trap, go back to other yeah. videos by Doug, because the beekeeping naturally it doesn't start with the box right. it starts with the bees so you need to obtain local bees but once you have the bees you can either build a hive like that with very simple tools mm -hmm. or purchase one from horizontalhive.com super easy i encourage you when you watch doug's videos to pay attention to how much bee forage he has on his farm yeah. uh, it's uh, always heartwarming for me to come and to see his small piece of paradise amidst the fields uh, planted in monoculture crops, not very healthy for us or for the bees. Yeah. But here I still see some white clover uh, in bloom, uh, uh, all kinds of things coming up almost continuously from the spring until late fall. Yeah, it's important to feed your pollinators, so don't just think about your garden for yourself. We have flowers all around this whole property for our pollinators. Oh my, very look good. at this. This is one strong hive, considering that it was just a split 
or an artificial swarm they did we took off of this hive um, maybe six weeks ago mm -hmm. or two months ago but they've expanded beautifully when you see bees like that hanging out in the empty portion of the hive where that's a very good uh, sign that the bees are strong and healthy and one of the benefits of having this extra room here is instead of bearding out as they would do on normal hives or regular American hives they have this room basically to chill out within the hive so but if the frames were here would they still hide out in there uh, they would still be able to because when you fill the whole hive with frames you still leave a crack for the hot air to rise and be vented out of the vents on the roof so this horizontal hive roof has screen vents or, that serve like attic vents mm -hmm. to prevent overheating mm -hmm. and there uh, also of course the box is built from lumber that's twice as thick as what you find in conventional hives right uh, also when you approach the hive you can tell many uh, a lot by looking at the entrance if you see regular activity with foragers coming and going you many times can predict what you see inside a healthy and thriving colony and there uh, is good that we open it today because when the bees are busy like that on the very last frame and they're you see they're more. starting to draw out their mm -hmm. wax on the frame it's time to be adding more frames otherwise they will continue building from the roof of uh, the hive rather than from the frames that you give them and that's worse than cross combing <laughs> and then you pull the lid off and everything busts open yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, at least with cross combing you have a option to do it or not you know yeah uh, <laughs> so look at this beautiful propolis mm -hmm. so they connect these uh, uh, tall bars together and in warm weather this propolis is like chewing gum and it will stick to your teeth too if you put some in your mouth <laughs> Uh, back in the day, the pioneers, that's a form of dental hygiene, was to chew on the wax and the, and the comb. And it still is in many parts of the world. Yeah. Like right here. <laughs> wow, look at this beautiful white comb that they're building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is all filled with uh, nectar, and they're starting to cap it here in the corner. And you guys will notice, um, maybe, these are a lot more calm than the other hive. They're uh, a little more golden in color, and they're a little more docile. Uh, we had the uh, bees were left over, and we actually had lost the queen, and we had a queen sent up from down south. And so this queen is responsible for the temperament of this hive. Yeah. But you can tell by the color of some bees that she mated with some local drones too see how some of the bees are much darker instead of being yellow oh, yeah. and uh, they are black with almost no yellow striping yeah this is the color of the european dark bee the local bee of the north and uh, the queen mates with multiple drones so some of them will have uh, uh, southern genetics like these workers with their yellow striping on the abdomen but on the same frame you have their sisters that are parented by the northern drone wow the european dark bee drone that will have a gray or almost no yellow striping at all just very dark color and this is the point even though you started with the queen that was brought here from mississippi uh, with each generation that passes the new queens are being uh, locally mated so the genetics of the bees becomes more and more adapted to the local conditions and the hardiness of winter too so how does that happen does the bee does the drone make it in here or does she go out and come back she goes out of the hive to mate and they have special drone congregation areas right. which is a big mystery because the bees uh, this year the drones and the queens they will go mating to special playgrounds where mating had happened in the previous years even though of course they were not alive in the previous year to know where exactly the spot is yeah. but the spot pretty much stays stationary year in and year out and scientists have no idea to the present day just how they know where they're supposed to do for mating right, right. and it's very important for them to be maintained in the wild 
uh, in uh, open flight because this prevents inbreeding. Right. If the drones could copulate with the queen inside the hive, there would be a lot of inbreeding, rendering the hive potentially non-viable. And totally weak, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have this amazing mechanism of avoiding inbreeding by going and mating uh, in open flight. And again, for the queen, it is important to have multiple mates so that diversity of the workers uh, is there in the hive. Right. They will be uh, children or daughters of different fathers and they will have different traits. You've seen some are yellow, some are black, some are better foragers, some are better guard bees, some right. are better ventilators. So having all of this diversity of workforce is important for the health of the bee colony. And now one thing I, oh, there's something going on with that. It just ripped apart. They had some cross comb going mm -hmm. on at the bottom. So they continued building this comb that we gave them. See how they already connected these parts right, here? Right, right. That's what they were doing down there. Uh-huh, and they attached this one slightly to the preceding frame, yep. And one thing I'm noticing is there's no hive beetles running around. Uh, I notice it too. Yeah. Okay, Doc, if something like that happens, if you see comb collapse, uh, don't just leave it there because they will be building around it, making three-dimensional catacombs. So you need to remove it from where it fell, but I would not remove it from the hive right now because it has brood, and it means you will waste the uh, the brood that's there. I would wait until it hatches, and then I would remove this small piece from the hive uh, altogether. So what I will do now, I will grab this piece that collapsed, and I will carefully detach it from the rest of the comb. First, I will see whether I can even put it back into this frame where it belongs and I think I'm going to do that. I will just gently squeeze it in there and it will rest in place and they will patch it. But normally when you cannot reattach it like I've done, uh, just remove it and put it in one corner of the hive, come back in a week or two and once there is no brood on it you can remove it. You could remove it straight away but then you've wasted all of the, the hard larva hard that are in there. No, that was good. It went right back in there. Yeah. Excellent. So very good. We see here is another healthy, thriving colony. And this one will actually produce you some honey. Uh, harvesting now would be too premature because you see on the frames that are being filled with nectar, the nectar is not capped yet. Right. Capping is the sign that the moisture content has been um, brought down to where it will not ferment on you. Right. And when it becomes real honey rather than nectar. It's also important because bees don't just evaporate moisture from nectar, they also add enzymes there and they convert some of the table sugars found in uh, the nectar of the plants into the good sugars found in fruit, fructose right. and glucose. Right. So let them do their magic for another month or so and after that you'll have a few frames to pull from here. There you go. And right now the only thing we have to do with this hive is to give them one or two more frames right. so they don't run out of room and don't, don't start building from the roof of the hive. Right. More hive? Yeah, thank you. Any more frames I mean? <clears throat> so when I insert the frame, if you see some bees between the two frames, uh, in addition to giving it a path uh, of smoke, uh, you can also wiggle the frame like that and any of the bees that may be in the way, they will get out of the way so that the frames can be put together without crashing a bee. And there is on the side of the frames, there's just a little bit of space between the frame and the wall. That's how this is designed, so they can go down the wall to other frames. And they can also ventilate it properly this right. way. Yeah. Very good, we're done with this one too. All right, here, I'm gonna show them that real quick. See, there's that little gap right there. All right. Oh my, I didn't know that was sitting there. Okay, we have wire here instead of the rope. <laughs> That's reassuring. Yeah. And let me look at the entrance there. Yep. Yeah, this whole hive feels real, real warm. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, very active.
So for. you have plenty of frames there. Just looking from here, I see that they are not drawing foundation on these frames yet. So you don't have to worry about them running out of room. And uh, let's take a peek at how they're progressing on these new frames that we added since last time. And they're doing nice. Uh, filling it with honey and building more calm. They build more calm when they run out of room storing things so even though there may still be room on the preceding one the frames they will start construction when they feel there is more nectar coming in that they have containers for storing. You know, this side is quite typical on plastic foundation. Yeah, see that? I've never really s seen that on uh, this ecological uh, uh, pesticide-free foundation from Spain that I'm using. But uh, I've seen it over and over again that if you give bees a choice between an empty frame where they build their own wax, plastic foundation or natural beeswax foundation, they will choose between their own wax or natural wax, but with the plastic wax they will oftentimes make irregular construction like what you see here. Yep. There were even instances where frames like that were loaded in a swamp trap, and when the swarm moved in, instead of starting to build wax on these plastic frames, they started building it from the bottom bar down, completely ignoring this plastic foundation. And that's not what you want. No. You know, I want to specify here that it also depends on the climate. In some climates, like Arizona, it gets so unbearably hot in the summer that plastic foundation is many times the only practical way to yeah. go because the natural wax may overheat and melt and collapse, especially if you use conventional beehives with very little insulation in the right. walls. Yeah, so insulation <clears throat> on your beehives isn't just for cold weather climates. It's also good for if you're in the hot areas as well. Absolutely. You know, most of my horizontal hives that I ship out, I either ship to New England or to Texas. Yeah. Let's take one frame out, but I can tell it just... Yeah, it's just it, you can just hear it. Yeah. It just sounds great. Yeah. And, you know, comp even the smell of it, you open the hive and there is a difference in the smell between mm -hmm. a healthy colony and the one that's experiencing problems with some kind of infestation. Right. Yeah, beautiful. So give them another two, three weeks and this will be completely capped uh, and ready to be pulled for extraction. If you ever have to pull a frame that has honey partially capped, don't e in extract it all at once. First spin it out gently without uncapping the sealed uh, cells. This will remove the nectar that is higher moisture content then drain it from the extractor and then do the uncapping and then you'll be able to separate nectar from the completely ripened honey. Right. But the, be the best way to proceed here is just to wait until everything is capped. Right. Uh, back home I do honey harvest as late as October, even the first week in November. I think we have done uh, November or late October for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you will see all of the fr all of these cells capped and there will be less disturbance on the bees mm -hmm. because many of the bees that are here now won't be here, won't be here anymore in two months time and uh, it will be better honey for you and less disturbance for the colony. Yeah. So some beekeepers actually draw honey twice a year. We've usually only drawn once and there have been years where we didn't draw any honey at all. Yeah, and it's a g very good practice to delay the harvest until late in the season. Let me explain why. Imagine you open this hive in early July and you see there are many frames that are packed with honey. You go ahead and you remove all of these frames from the hive, uh, thinking that the bees will continue filling it with honey in July, and August and September. But why? what if weather becomes unfavorable for foraging? It becomes too hot or too dry or too rainy or too cold depending on where you live. 
if they're prevented from foraging then all of a sudden you open the hive in September preparing it for the end of the season and you see they're really short on stores and you need to provide them something for winter survival and you've already extracted all the honey most beekeepers will give them sugar water right. for the winter so there you've compromised the integrity of their food supply by pulling honey too early and going into the part where they need it the most because it's getting cold and they're not as active so they're yeah. going to be sickly inside with the sugar water yeah so uh, it's really good practice to always be leaving a stockpile of reserve honey in the hive and in the long hive like that because there is so much room for them to store honey uh, as long as the hive continues to be strong you are not losing anything by delaying harvest by a couple of months you'll just uh, be harvesting it at the time of the year when you can tell exactly how much you are leaving behind for the winter and this way you can avoid sugar feeding completely now is there if the if the hive is this long so to say this this length uh horizontal hive is there a certain amount that you suggest in leaving how many frames or do you just kind of see how big the hive is how big the swarm? it will it will really depend on the uh, strength of the colony, colony. Yeah. but as a rule of thumb a really strong colony wintering on laying and strauss frames it will probably need between 12 and 14 frames uh, some of them on the ends will be fully filled with honey they won't touch it during the winter but this is their spring reserve right um, but an average colony can overwinter on 10 frames wow and many beekeepers will think oh it's not much because we overwinter our colonies in double deep chambers that means 20 frames but in the old days Langstroth himself he designed the hive to be hosting a colony that will be overwintering on 10 frames on the understanding that the smaller colony is actually healthier and more sustainable than the really big ones. Right. The reason why we still have lizards but we don't have dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah, I just see wonderful frames are being filled with honey. And lots One of propolis. Yeah. And lots of propolis too. So let's open it on this end. We don't really have to, but uh, to check the brood chamber and uh, make sure that there is brood. There is almost certainly brood because uh, otherwise you wouldn't have such a strong population of the bees. But uh, even Layans, the author of Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives, was saying that during your first few years of beekeeping, it's actually permissible to be opening and inspecting the hives more often because you are gaining experience. Mm -hmm. Getting used to working with them. Mm -hmm. Because I was when I first started beekeeping, I was heavy into kind of getting in there every couple of weeks or once a month, and as I've gotten better at beekeeping, more confident, I backed off of getting in there. So. So here is a frame with brood. We don't need to find the queen. The presence of healthy brood tells you that uh, the queen is there. And the strength of the hive is another indicator of the quality of your queen. Mm -hmm. Compare the pattern of brood though here compared to the Lane's hive. See how she had to spread right. the laying There's in no the circle. Instead of the circle, it's like that. And we know just from geometry that uh, a sphere is a perfect shape for uh, limiting the loss of heat from the surface of it. So the closer it, it, it is to the circle, the better it is for the bees in terms of temperature regulation, ventilation and protection. Nice. We just came out of the bee yard and right when we were done I caught one right in the eye So if you guys don't uh, see me in a video for the next little bit I might take care of those little puffs I got underneath my eye, too <laughs> But boy that was a good one now if you guys ever get stung just real quick You don't squeeze it and pinch it to pull it out. You want to scrape it You can use your fingernail. You can use your hive tool. You can use a credit card You just want to scrape it off because at the end of that stinger is a pus sack and in there is all the venom and if you go to squeeze it out and pull it out you're gonna push all that venom right through that stinger and right into your 
skin. So once you get the stinger out, pour a little apple cider vinegar right where the sting happened and it'll take away the pain and it works really good. So there's your little uh, on the way out nugget yeah. for the ste. Uh, we'll see how this one, uh, I can feel it, but we'll see how this one puffs up on us. So Yeah, a cube of ice also go, yeah. goes a long way. That would just feel good today, period. It's like 100 degrees out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, I really appreciate you coming up oh, and checking out the hive. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got some books, I see. Yeah, I do. You know, uh, things that we were doing today, they are really explained in great detail mm -hmm. in the several books that I published and translated from French and from Russian. The number one is Keeping Bees with a Smile, the 20 20 edition. It's been a bestseller for five or six years already, but this new edition published early in 2020 really has much more additional information on successful natural beekeeping either in horizontal hives or in vertical hives too, because many of the principles stay the same. Uh, this is the one that we were using when we were increasing the number of ducks colonies earlier this year so instead of two colonies we had four now we have three but with still 50 percent increase and raising honeybee queens walks you step by step with lots of full color pictures as to how to become your own bee breeder so you never have to buy bees again and we could have had seven eight nine ten hives i just didn't have any space to put them in we were like right there queen cells everywhere and he was uh, actually at our conference he speaks every year at our homesteading life conference and he was explaining to y'all how you can actually make really good money with your natural bees on your property selling queens and nukes you guys can do this package them together what does a package of bees sell for a local caught swarm? it can be anywhere from 200 to 500 dollars depending on your marketing yeah skills. you see what i mean but the local queens are um, you know there is a waiting list with people who produce local queens yeah and they may sell one queen for a thousand bucks i mean see so there's lots of different ways that you guys can break free from that nine to five and live this homesteading life that you guys are watching because you know you want it and we keep showing you guys how you can do it and not only just the queens but then you have the honey and just all the things that come with it <laughs> keeping bees in horizontal hives right. are, is the book written by layans these european style frames that we now have in two of the hives were invented and tested by layans in france so this is where the name of the hive is coming from so he describes his 20 years of beekeeping experience with horizontal hives with this book so even if you just contemplate having bees in horizontal hive this is a book to have because it is managed differently from the vertical stand yes and for Finally, you know, a lot of inspiration I draw from this book, uh, Honey from the Earth, that takes you around the world without you leaving your armchair to 23 countries, showing you how bees are kept today everywhere from right. Africa and jungles in uh, uh, Asia and Australia and US and China. And some people still keep bees in lock hives like this. Others, like in Russia, they still um, go into trees and there are hollow there out highs right inside the tree that you climb up to collect honey from so for me keeping bees is not just about the livelihood right. or honey or wax or any, anything other that's useful for us right it's really the experience of witnessing this amazing life form and feeling more alive myself right from immersing myself in our nature and interacting with this amazing insect society yeah when you guys are passionate about that everything else will fall into place but this is an easy kind of a thing that you can get into just as a hobby we, a lot of people after our last video were curious they were just going to put out a box they didn't really want to do the beekeeping but you had mentioned that you could just put a box out just to provide them a safe place to live and Correct. it's beneficial for everyone and there was a lot of people that were going to do that as well so very encouraging and i'm glad to see that we can harvest a lot of that uh, comb and then still use it on the homestead so that's important to um to know it's not just like you don't have to just destroy all the equipment or anything i do have some repairs on that one to make now yeah you do <laughs>
<laughs> and do remember to put a, uh, a, wire. a wire instead of the string on the yeah. roof. That was a hand-me-down beehive, yeah. so... <laughs> and nobody would believe us that it was not set up by you and me. No, I mean, we were just... I mean, you should see his face. You saw it. <laughs> Bloop. All right, as always, thanks for coming by the homestead. If you guys have any questions, make sure you leave them down below. We try to get to your questions and answer them. And one question I can remember off the top of my head is, um, in the last video, you had mentioned about... Uh, the plywood that you used was organic or no, chemical was, free. No, no, it was formaldehyde free. Formaldehyde free. Mm -hmm. So how do you get that? Do you just ask for it at the big box store? Or? Yeah, you can, but actually they don't know. You need to go and look at your local suppliers of plywood and go to their website and read what's called the SDS, safety da data sheet for right. each plywood and you will find a few that will have no formaldehyde in it. But these manufacturers, when they sell through the big box stores, they don't really advertise that it's formaldehyde free, right. because then people will start asking store managers questions about the other kinds of right. plywood. What about this one, this one? Oh, it has still <laughs> formaldehyde in it. No, thank you. Right. So, but yeah, you, you can find it here and there, even the largest manufacturers, just check them out there and you will see that they have some of the brands and grades of plywood that are now formaldehyde free. You just need to dig into that and there find it in their SDS data sheet. Yeah, see, we read the questions and we answer them. Now for the big announcement. It is. <laughs> now you won't believe it, but uh, one month from now, October 3rd and 4th, I have the two day natural beekeeping class at my apiary and Doug is going to be a guest. Yes. Uh, you can imagine how difficult to take Doug away from his homestead with his lovely wife <laughs> and uh, all the animals and bees and other things that anchor you to your place. Yeah. And you don't even feel like leaving and going on a tropical vacation because it's so peaceful and beautiful. <laughs> but I've been trying to talk Doug into coming to my two-day bee class for years now. Yeah. And he finally agreed. So he will be there October 3rd and 4th, 2020. And uh, you can register at horizontalhive.com and attend this class and meet Doug too at the same time. And thanks for watching his channel. And uh, uh, if you want to make it to this class, we are offering you $50 off your registration fee. Just make sure when you register on horizontalhive.com that you use the coupon code OFFGRID in one word, okay. off grid. Make sure when you go to horizontalhive.com and you register for that class that you put in there off grid in the coupon code so you can save some money and so you're coming to the class where I'll be and he'll be and we'll all be. If you miss it, you'll probably be at the wrong class and then you'll still get the great Dr. Leo, but no Doug. So make sure you guys uh, check out the website, horizontalhive.com. Check out the books. Hopefully we'll see you guys. It's limited seating. So hopefully we'll see you guys at the apiary at his place. And maybe we'll do this again next year in case you miss it this year. We'll have some hope out for you. So maybe you can catch us there next year. Yeah. And if you're watching it now, when this video just came out, please don't delay because the September workshop is already completely full. It's sold out. Yeah. So we still have seats left uh, as of this filming at the October 3rd and 4th, 2020 class. But uh, if you want out. to be there, it's going to sell out. Right. So uh, look forward to seeing you there. That's Thank the you. buzz. So thanks for stopping by the homestead and we'll see you guys on the next video. See ya. Man, how's it look? No, no, it's not bad. If you didn't tell them you have it, nobody would know. <laughs>